I'd like you to join with me for just a moment in time of quiet. There's a statement that we have used in our unity work for years, and it's so closely related to the fundamental concept that underlies the Ten Commandments. There is only one presence and one power, God the Good, Omnipotent. I want us to think of this for just a moment, relating to all of our life and affairs. We become very preoccupied with things in our human relationships and in our jobs and in our homes, become concerned and anxious and tense, and we lose sight of this fundamental principle of oneness, of wholeness. So we want to begin at this point. There is only one presence and one power, God the good omnipotent. One mind in which our minds are but a state of consciousness. One life in which our body temples are part of the flow. One substance which all of our finances demonstrate according to our perception. One source of love and peace and justice. One presence and one power, God the good omnipotent. And we are now established in this consciousness. And so we give thanks for this consciousness and we know that This will guide us and direct us and bless us in all of our considerations this evening. And so be it. Reading the Old Testament, we get a picture of uh, a sometimes cruel, sometimes benevolent, often capricious God who lays down laws for people down here on earth we poor mortals. In the Exodus story of Moses receiving the commandments lends itself to the kind of Hollywood uh, treatment of uh, the picture of God up in the skies with the long white beard and the bulging muscles uh, a la Michelangelo. And Moses receiving these commandments, this great big heavy tablet in stone of the commandments, the dictates handed down by God. Now, actually, though reading the Bible superficially, we kind of get this picture. Yet if that's the conclusion we draw, we've missed the whole idea. God didn't hand down the commandments to Moses. It's a very important point, and I think that one has to really carefully read the Bible and uh, and consider all the factors involved to understand this. Um, The full meaning of Mount Sinai can only be understood when we see it against the symbolism that prevails throughout all the Bible relative to high states of consciousness. If we try to find Mount Sinai as a literal historical place, then we're in trouble. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, biblical archaeologists have been searching for Mount Sinai for a long time. And I suppose they assume that if they find the mountain and find the exact place, that they'll still find the little bits of, of the stone, the commandments that were broken up there on the mountain. Now, it's understandable, you see, because there has been such a constant conditioning of the literal aspect of these biblical events that uh, it's very difficult to consider it in, in a esoteric or a spiritual or metaphysical sense. In other words, it's important to get the idea that... Um, Infinite mind is everywhere, in all, through all, and everyone exists in infinite mind. So that you don't have to go anywhere to get into mind. You simply must lift your consciousness, become or expand your consciousness, or become more aware of the wholeness in which you are a part, or the allness in which you are in eachness. 
So Mount Sinai deals with the mountaintop experience of spiritual awareness. We find in the New Testament where Jesus had frequent times when he had a need to go apart, and it said he would go into the mountain to pray. It's quite likely, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's almost tr- sure, if you carefully read through the, the gospel story, that this really talks about, in a symbolical sense, about Jesus going into a high place. He might have been going out into the desert. He might have been just going out of doors into a garden, but he was going to a mountain to have this elevated awareness of his oneness with God. So if we can catch this sense, then then we look at Moses' experience again. And we see that, that Moses brought to this particular time on Mount Sinai, whether it was a mountain or a place in consciousness, brought to, brought to this experience an awareness of the needs of his people, the experience of some tremendous dynamic things that had happened within him, and a commitment to somehow bring the awareness that he had experienced within himself to these people to help them to find freedom from their bondage in Egypt and to help them to find their own promised land by somehow bringing this high awareness down into the language that they could understand and into the needs of these people. And the great contribution of Moses was not to give the Ten Commandments or the so-called Mosaic Law, but that which these things symbolically portrayed. And unless we are looking for that inner meaning, then we miss the whole idea. Um, It could be said, and perhaps should be, that... uh, Paraphrasing Robert Browning, who, uh, you recall, made the statement, uh, God could not create Antonio Stradivari's violins without Antonio, that God could not have created the Mosaic Law without Moses. Now, this may seem to be a very subtle point, but it's a very important point. Because the so-called Mosaic Law, or the heart and soul of the Ten Commandments, was not something that was just handed down from God, and Moses was simply an intermediary of passing them along. But it was something that came out of Moses' own commitment, his own feelings, and his own intellectual techniques that were involved in trying to help these people to find the kind of guidance that he felt they they needed, using his own awareness of the transcendence of God-mind as a resource. But he put it together, you see. And so therefore, what actually evolved in terms of the commandments and in terms of all of the provisions of the Mosaic Law came out of the insights and the consciousness and the judgment of Moses himself. And there's another uh, consideration that builds on this. Moses wrote moralistic and ethical rules and codes for behavior, rules for action, covering dietary and sanitary regulations and every conceivable aspect of life, important for nomadic people who were living out of doors, all this known as the Mosaic Law, applying to every phase of life, legal, moral, physical, as well as spiritual. But Moses himself brought this out of his own high awareness of truth. And he was putting this high state of consciousness into the kind of experiences that he felt these people needed and on the level that they could understand them. In other words, he was building fences, He was giving them well-outlined highways on which to travel, guidelines by which to live, and so forth. But ultimately, he knew, as all great teachers have known, that the person becomes in bondage to the specific codes and rules and ethical standards and so forth unless and until he ultimately grows up, puts away childish things, finds his own relationship with the infinite and has his own mountaintop experience. That's the part that is normally missed. So for this reason, I think it's important that, that we recognize that all religious codes and creeds and theological precepts need to be re-examined by every generation 
in the light of that generation's consciousness and needs. Much of, of Judaism, for instance, follows to the letter the Mosaic customs, most of which were designed purely and simply for life in that time and have nothing whatever to do with people in other times. The great need today, both in Judaism and Christianity, and all the divisions and schisms within these organized religious groups, is to take a new look at the traditions and the creeds and the codes and to seek to relate them vitally to life in contemporary times, to make them relevant, in other words. So I ask the question, this is sort of the starting point of this whole general consideration of the Ten Commandments. I asked it, I have asked it through the last few weeks, and I'm asking it now. Are the Ten Commandments relevant in our time? Are they applicable to human needs today? Are they still acceptable as the rule for behavior? Can we live a satisfactory life if, as so many people say, we just live by the Ten Commandments? And my feeling is that we cannot answer that question unless we make a commitment as to how we're going to deal with the commandments. If we deal with them super, superficially, in the way in which most folks deal with religion, where we put it in a box, subscribe to it, we are nominally members of a religious organization, we have our membership somewhere, we may be married there and buried there and so forth, baptized there and have our children go to school there, and so we say, yes, that's my religion. If this is the way we deal with the Ten Commandments, then I must say they are totally irrelevant for our time and totally unacceptable as a basis for living. But if we're willing to break them down and really get into the, the fundamental spiritual roots involved, then we may well find that the Ten Commandments provide today, as they did thousands of years ago, a tremendous basis for what I call the integrated life. You see, the, the unfortunate part of, of religion has always been its preoccupation with cliches. I call it cliché religion. Custom-made convictions. You know, you subscribe to a magazine and you subscribe to a religion. In other words, you shop around to find the religion that's acceptable that you can subscribe to. And you buy the creed custom-made. I mean, this is... This is not really making light of it. It's looking carefully and analytically at, uh, at what is involved in religion normally. So religion is something that you accept in toto. And normally the religious persuasion, whatever it is, will in one way or another insist that ours is not to reason why. You're not supposed to question whether this is right. This is the religion. So then you wind up with something that, that you refer to as we believe. We believe this, and we believe that, and we believe the other, and this is what we believe because that's my religion. I believe that. You know, it's like joining the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or the Socialist Party or being an independent or whatever, you see. So that there is a general tendency of accepting the cliches that go along under that particular religious banner. And that, unfortunately, leads to a great deal of hypocrisy. Subtle, unconscious, but it's a case of going through the motions which at most may involve some emotions, but which has very little to do with the real development and unfoldment of one's soul. I can remember as a child, for instance, most of you probably are <clears throat> aware of the fact that I have spent most of my life involved in, in something related to this unity concept, but I had an early childhood before that, a few years, and... Uh, and my folks belonged to the Episcopalian Church, and uh, I was a choir boy in the Episcopalian Church. And uh, at age, I think maybe age six, I started going to catechism school. I used to go every Saturday. And uh, the rector was a stern, angry sort of a fellow. I guess he saw God that way, and he was trying to put that on. And uh, this catechism school was grim business. And I can remember learning the Ten Commandments in this setting. And I can remember that every Saturday I would dread going and played hooky quite a few times too and had some bruises to show for it because um, this, in this day and in this particular <clears throat> religious relationship, the, the pastor had the perfect privilege, right, and responsibility to administer corporal punishment, which was usually administered right on the spot. <laughs> so that studying the Ten Commandments was always coupled with a lot of knuckle-wrapping 
and a lot of good hard spankings. If you questioned it, or if you didn't come back the next Saturday with some of the things memorized, you know, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord giveth thee, and etc., you know, that sort of thing. And I can remember so clearly the whole thing that went along with this, and through the years I've seen it, and uh, it's, it's, it's never made any sense to me, and yet this is what is normally accepted in religion. The thing was, you go to catechism school, you learn a catechism. That's what religion's all about. Your parents send you there, you learn it, you memorize it, you go through the motions, learn when to stand and sit in church and all the things, you know, the whole bit. And then you're confirmed, and then it's all over. It's all over. Whether you go to church for the rest of your life really doesn't matter. You're confirmed now. And most people become confirmed stay awares as a result of it. Because, uh, <laughs> because I certainly remember that if, if I had been left on my own devices and if my family hadn't gotten involved in some more relevant concepts in later years, I certainly never would have been very religious. Because I had all the interest in religion spanked out of me and knuckle-wrapped out of me during that time. It was grim business that nobody wanted anything to do with, but you do it till you're confirmed. You know, or till your bar mitzvah or whatever it is. After that, you go your own way. And uh, the average individual who is nominally religious uh, maybe goes to church on during the Advent season or Easter or the high holidays or whatever, but the rest of the time, well, he's nominally a member of that church, but they never see him. So the point is, Moses' great contribution, you see, and one that, that has been so rarely understood and grasped is his own experience of feeling the transition from the personality of God to the principle of the divine process. In Moses' 40 years in the wilderness, he found God as a presence. He had that realization, the ground on which you stand is holy ground. He discovered that the burning bush was not just out there, that he was the burning bush that he had this source of divine fire within him, that he had his own unique relationship to the principle and the process of God mind. So that the Ten Commandments are basically ten aspects of human experience which, to which we need to make a personal commitment toward wholeness or toward the integrated life. And this, I believe, very strongly is what Moses was about. And if we're willing to dig into them, the one thing we find, and I suppose some of you have found that through the weeks if you've gone along with us in this study, is we become aware of the fact, first of all, how much there is involved in the Ten Commandments, how much there is involved in this whole general study of truth, how much growing we still have to do, how little we really know, how even after years and years of study, we've just scratched the surface. And some people say, well, that, you know, it makes you kind of discouraged. But it shouldn't, because then we know we're on the right track. If we buy the thought that may be disseminated sometimes that at the result of a particular course of study or at the result of reading a book or the result of belonging to this organization for a limited period of time, that you're suddenly going to have made it, you have a license, you have a certificate, you have a degree or a confirmation or whatever, and now you really have it and it's all over with, you're deluding yourself. The important thing is that we do not become satisfied, but that we become divine discontent, that we realize we have a long way to go. So let's just take a look at these commandments again, kind of in review. And the thing that we've stressed over and over again, and I want to make a special point of it tonight, is that the, the commandments are built solidly around the structure of one commandment, of one idea, of one principle, one process. All the rest is commentary on it. All the rest deals with certain applications of it in certain phases of our life. But it's one fundamental idea. It's the first commandment. And the fundamental idea is simply oneness. The foundation of the whole structure of the commandments, the whole structure of the Mosaic Law, the whole of the teaching of Jesus, all the Bible, all metaphysics, all that we can ever get into, no matter how complicated it may become, builds upon this fundamental idea of oneness, of wholeness. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Or the Jewish Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
But the thought Jesus refers to, thou shalt uh, uh, worship the Lord thy God, uh, my mind suddenly went blank. Of course, mine doesn't go blank. <laughs> that, um, that you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But this idea of the oneness, of the wholeness, the allness, this is the whole thing. And one can work at this business of metaphysics month after month, year after year, on and on and on. And yet we always have to come back to that. That's the basic idea. That's the, the fundamental principle. Now this means then that there's a great deal more involved in an intellectual acceptance of, of a creed that says, I believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, etc., etc., etc. No one really believes because he says he believes. Many people say, I know I believe in God because I say I believe in God. But as one writer once said, uh, he believed in God, but he never really gave too much thought to what he meant by God. It's not a matter of just intellectually accepting something, but it is a fundamental sense of belonging. It's like a woman once with Ralph Waldo Emerson. She suddenly blurted out, and it was a great revelation to her, and many people probably laughed, but she said, I accept the universe. And his response was, well, by God, you'd better. And I'm sure he was making light of something that was very serious to her. But this is what it is. I accept it. I don't question it. I don't analyze it. I don't try to find it. I don't try to define it. I accept it. I accept the idea of the wholeness of things, of the allness of life, the allness of God, in which I exist. I accept the universe. And I know that I'm a part of it, and I'm the focal point of it. I'm right in the center of it. And the universe envelops me. And it supports me and sustains me with fundamental spiritual process. I accept God as the allness in which I exist as an eachness, as the infinite mind in which my mind is a state of consciousness, in which my life is simply a flowing process. I accept it. And I start with that acceptance and build on it. Now this is, this is the idea, you see, of the oneness or the wholeness of things. This is not saying, well, now, let's see. Let's read chapter so-and-so where it talks about God. And I read about this and that and that. Yes, yes, yes. I know God is mine. God is love. God is substance and so forth. And I get my mind so full of all his intellectualizations that I finally say, I have it. I know what God is. And then we give the answer. God is da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Now all we can say is we know that God is da-da-da-da-da-da-da. But we still don't know what God is. And we do not experience God, and we may well not have accepted God because we're too involved in the intellectual process. So the point is, at the heart and root of the whole spiritual study is this realization of all this. And the commandment calls for a commitment, a commitment to this one, to know you are one with the one and one in the one. All mind, all life, all substance. You are one with it, and you're one in it. And it's in you. You are that whole activity expressing itself as you. And this is the principle to which we must constantly return. And if we don't return to this principle, we can very easily get lost in the far country of all sorts of metaphysical seeking and searching. We suddenly realize then that such a basic thing as prayer or treatment can only really make sense if it builds on the principle and if it forsakes the old tendency of trying to reach the personality. As I say so often, don't pray to God. Most of us have been conditioned to that process and to that language. You say, well, if you stop praying to God, you know, what is prayer all about? Don't pray to God. Pray from the principle or from the consciousness of God. As long as we're praying to God, we're out in the far country. We've lost the sense of oneness. If you are one in the one, then you have no one to pray to. You are the very activity of God. Your mind is, an, is a state of consciousness in the allness of God's mind. Now, this doesn't do away with prayer or with treatment or affirmation or any of the spiritual realizations that we may have followed. But what it does do is it means that whenever we have a need, rather than frantically sending off missiles of prayer to God somewhere, we follow the injunction of the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. Nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. 
You are in the allness of mind. You're not aware of it. You have to go into the mountain, but not off to Mount Sinai, not off to the temple, not off to some holy place somewhere, but into the mount of your own spiritual awareness to know that right where you are, the ground on which you stand is holy ground. Let that be the beginning, the starting point, the fundamental. And then out of that awareness, speak the word of truth. In other words, you go back to the one, the basic one. You remember uh, the, the principle of Pythagoras is that, that all things are come out of, the un of unity and all are resolvable back in the one. The whole process of mathematics, it all begins with the, the figure one. You start with that number. All things start with the one, the one presence and the one power. So the, the whole practice of prayer must be getting back to the one, back to the root, back to the realization, as we said tonight, there's only one presence and one power, God the good omnipotent. I live within this allness of God. As the father said to the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son, son, thou art ever with me, and all that is mine is thine. That's the inner assurance. Begin at that point. If all that God is and all that God has is mine, then I don't have to sit and pray that God will give me something. God can't give me anything if God is all and I'm alive in that allness. You see? So we start with the allness, and out of that consciousness we pray, but we pray from the principle. So we speak the word of truth. We're not trying to reach God somewhere. We're beginning with God, beginning with the principle. When you go to add up a column of figures and you're working with mathematics, you don't uh, somehow throw darts at the principle of mathematics somewhere so that the answer will come on your paper. You start with the principle and then you add up the figures and you get the answer. You start with the principle of the oneness or the wholeness, of the allness in which you exist as an eachness, and then you affirm the truth or speak the word and project this consciousness, which is a dynamic part of the prayer process, but you're not speaking the word or praying to make it happen. You're praying to get the awareness in mind and soul and body and experience of that which is already true. So your prayer is a confirmation rather than a supplication, you see. So this is the principle. This is the root. We're not trying to get into God or to get God into us. And I'm always saddened when I hear someone, and even more saddened, tragically so, when I hear a metaphysical teacher make a statement such as, if you do this and this and this, you will get God to come into your life. God can't come into your life because God never went out of your life. There's no possible way, you see. As long as we talk about trying to get into God or get God into us, then we're dealing with God out here. We've, we've totally abandoned the idea of one, the one presence, the one power, the allness of God, you see. And this is very important. It's very fundamental. And the whole structure of the commandments are built upon this and rest on this and evolve from this. And our whole study of metaphysics, if it's really going to be dynamically effective, builds upon this fundamental principle of oneness. The one self-existent, self-transforming power of which everything is some kind of a manifestation. Now that's the fundamental. And then all is kind of commentary on that. The second commandment, thou shalt not make any graven images. Any time we look to or lean on any person or anything or any situation as the means of power or the source of power, we frustrate our own inner flow. And that's the real sin and the only sin in life, the frustration of our inner potentiality. Every kind of sin that persons or society as a whole commits boils down to idolatry, putting something before the allness before the one. That's why Jesus says you cannot worship God and mammon. As long as you're involved in thinking money is the source of power in life, then you abandon this awareness that the one presence and one power at the heart and root of your being is your only security. It's your only means, really, to have a dynamic and effective life. Anything else is superficial. Anything else is like Jesus tells the story of the man who builds his house upon sand. And when the winds and storms come, it all washes away. So then the third commandment says, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And the name of the Lord, as Moses clearly outlines it, is the I am, that divine focus within you. This is the name, this is the nature of the activity of God, and it's the pivotal power of human consciousness. You can direct this I am process into constructive and positive ways, or you can pervert it into negative and destructive ways. The divine process is always saying yes, but sometimes we say no. 
And that no becomes the, the key of so much of the negative experiences of our life. Now, in a sense, you can't really take the name of the Lord in vain because whatever you take begins to manifest, begins to fulfill itself. So if you, if you couple your I am with some negative situation, then actually that power works. It's not in vain. It's not that you, it doesn't work for you in that sense. It works just as well. The dynamic creative power of mind works just as effectively in a negative way as it does in a positive way. That's the startling part. But it also can be a very helpful part because you can, people often say, oh, you know, I'm not demonstrating much lately. No. Everything that manifests in your life today is what you're demonstrating. If you're out of work, you're demonstrating. If you're sick, you're demonstrating. That's the whole process. Truth demonstrates itself, whether it's perverted or whether it's directed into positive ways. So, and what this commandment is saying, that you can't take the name of the Lord in vain. There's no way. It means that we're dealing with something that is self-fulfilling, self-revealing, dynamic and spontaneous. So you know the demonstrating process is always working, so if you were demonstrating unemployment, all right. The very demonstration of unemployment itself has revealed to you that the divine process works. Praise God, it works. Now I know that even as I demonstrated unemployment, by redirecting the process and taking that name or nature of the I am process of God in its dynamic positive way, I can demonstrate employment. If I have financial insolvency, I can demonstrate solvency and fulfillment and sufficiency and prosperity. If I have sickness, I can demonstrate health. We're working with the same law. It's pretty exciting when you think of it on that basis. And we can stop feeling that I've been abandoned by the universe or by God because I have problems in my life. Quite often people say, oh, how could God allow this to happen to me? How could the law of gravity cause you to hold you in your seat and keep you walking when you walk and at the same time make you fall and stub your toe if you lose your balance? Because it's gravity, because it's inexorable, because it constantly works. The law of mind action works in this way. We determine, the Bible says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. If we choose mammon, if we choose materiality, if we choose negativity, then that's the way the law works. But it's working all the time. So we want to catch ourselves up. Anytime we begin to say, how could God allow this to happen to me when I've been such a good truth student? The moment we do that, we've broken the first commandment. We've broken the second commandment. We've broken the third commandment. We've broken a lot of commandments. If you stop and analyze them, we're getting away from the whole process. If God is allness and you're in allness, then, then you couldn't possibly say, how could God allow this to happen to me? Because you are in eachness within the allness which is God. If anything happens in your life that is not harmonious and not orderly, it certainly isn't because God has something against you and God is punishing you. As someone once said, and I think very rightly, we are not punished for our sins, we're punished by them. The sin itself is our own state of consciousness, and so we punish ourselves for the misuse of the law. So then the next commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, unfortunately, this has been used as sort of a club by institutional religion, and in that sense, it has fail to really break out of the box this marvelous spiritual principle that is involved, something to which we need to commit ourselves. It's not just a matter of you've got to go to church, you've got to go to the synagogue, you've got to have your religious observances. These are fine. They're disciplines. They're excellent. But that isn't what this is talking about. The Sabbath, the word Sabbath, comes from the word Shabbat, the Hebrew word. And actually it refers basically to rest, communion, and the emphasis is upon the rhythm of the universe, the ebb and flow of the tides, the rising and setting of the sun, the diastole and the systole of the heart, this constant process of movement, this dynamic something. And as the first chapter of Genesis puts it, six days thou shalt rest, and on the, uh, six days thou shalt work or labor, and on the seventh he shall rest. And this is the flow of life, and man has always seen this. He's seen it in terms of the need of rotating crops in the soil, and he's seen it in the need of of having occasional vacations and rests in his life that you can't, you know, it's, it's said uh, all work and no play make Jack a dull boy and that comes out of the same concept, you see. The need for change, the need for diversity. But more important, the need to 
have a time where we commit ourselves to communion. Much of the time in our life we're drawing upon the flow and we can become overdrawn at the bank, as it were, because we're not recharging and eventually we begin to draw it out of our subconsciousness. And because we have, in the very act of working in this way, separated ourselves from the flow of the divine process, we get overdrawn. And therefore there's a need to enter in and close the door and get ourselves established once again. What in? First commandment. The one. Back to the one. This is what the, the Sabbath experience is. It's a time when you commit yourself to returning to the principle. It's not just on a Sunday or a Saturday or any other particular holy day. It's any time and any minute. Perhaps you're having a Sabbath experience right now. Perhaps you have one many times a day. You should have. You don't have to take an hour. You can do it in just a minute. You find yourself at your desk and you find yourself a little overdrawn, which means you're pooped, or you're getting a little disturbed or anxiety or anxious or perhaps a little annoyed at your boss because he's expecting too much from you, then if you really make a commitment to this commandment to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, then you will say, I must know now that I am involved in the wholeness of life. And the very fact that I'm beginning to feel frayed at the edges is an indication that I'm overdrawn. So I'd better in just one minute now just be still and cool it and know that I'm one in the one. 30 seconds, 15, 10 seconds. Snap your finger. I don't care. It doesn't take time. It's out of time. Just to know your source. And that's a Sabbath experience. It might be a second. It might be an hour. It might be a two-week or a whole year sabbatical. And the word sabbatical comes from the Sabbath, the same root word. But it means to engage in the inner experience of oneness. And we'd have to commit ourselves to that. That's the importance of that commandment. And there's honor thy father and thy mother. Now this has unfortunately been gotten bogged down in, in the family relationship of being good to your parents. Now, there's nothing wrong with being good to your parents. As a matter of fact, it's vitally important. But how do you go about having respect for your parents? The unfortunate part is children have been taught it's your responsibility to be good to your parents. And so a child grows up, and as he becomes an adolescent and, and he becomes a young adult, he finds himself thinking, well, you know, I guess you're supposed to be good to the old man and the old lady, so, uh, you know, you send him a Mother's Day card and you take Dad out to play golf once in a while, you know, just so that you fulfill your responsibility. And I say, yuck. You know. <laughs> It's like, it's like in, in race relations, the idea of tolerance. We should be tolerant. You know, I hate that word. I shouldn't say hate. But I really, it gives me great distaste because if you tolerate something, you mean you have something intolerable that you're tolerating. And you've created the intolerable situation. It's a state of mind in your own consciousness and now you're going to tolerate it. So you build a straw man and now you're building this whole thing around of accepting it and going along and acting as if everything's fine and you have all these conflicts within you. That's what's always been wrong with human consciousness, you see. So responsibility to love your parents. Anytime you have to do something, you don't do it with any heart. It's like the little boy said, don't say must to me because it makes me feel won't all over. <laughs> and an awful lot of the, quote, respect for parents is superficially built on this inner won't. And therein lies the conflicts. So obviously the, the commandment is not, is not based upon this. I mean, this is an outgrowth of it. But the point is you cannot respect anybody until you respect yourself. And if you don't respect yourself, then you have no respect for anything. And if you respect yourself, you don't have to be taught to respect anyone. You respect life. And the thing you respect most and love most and understand most are the po per people closest to you, your parents, your loved ones, your relationships. But it comes naturally as an outgrowth of self-respect. So the honor the father and mother obviously has a far deeper meaning. The word honor, strangely enough, frighteningly enough when you stop and think of what it really means, is the word kabad, which means burden. 
So that many folks, and this may have been the literal aspect of the commandment, you must burden yourself with taking care of your father and your mother. It's your responsibility, it's your duty. But the word burden has another implication. It means that you are heavy with child. That's the great burden, which is a delightful burden. You know, a, a pregnant woman has a burden that she loves if she's really in, into the thing of motherhood. I mean, it's a beautiful thing that's happening. The Christ of each of us within ourselves is the unborn possibility of limitless life, and it's our privilege and our joy to give birth to it. Honor your father and your mother. Now, the interesting thing about this is that someone once said that the, that the, the child is the parent of the adult. And I think this is an aspect of this that we need to look at. I, I mentioned when we dealt with this a few weeks ago that, uh, that I recalled a, a lecture or a lesson that was given to a group of students of which I was a part in junior high school a few years ago. And uh, the subject that was announced sounded like a good old Sunday school moralistic lesson, be good to your old man. And we all got the shock of our life because he didn't talk about parents at all. It was a doggone good lesson one that I've never forgotten. I imagine a lot of those young folks didn't because what he was saying was that what you are and what you do and what you think and what you get into today and what you get hooked on today is going to have everything to do with the person you become later as you get older. That person of your life is still you, but it's your old man. It's you when you're a little older. So be good to that old man by what you do and think and how you act today pretty good lesson for kids, wasn't it? Very good lesson. I've never forgotten it. And I think that is a, is a marvelous implication involved in this honor your father and your mother. Now, obviously, the only parent, the only father-mother is the father-mother principle of God, and it means to honor God. But if you really honor God, honor yourself in wholeness, honor the oneness in which you live, the allness in which you exist as an eachness unfolding, then you have self-knowledge, self-reverence, self-respect. And out of that consciousness comes love and understanding for all persons. Nobody has to say, you better be good to your parents. You couldn't be otherwise. You couldn't be otherwise than good and loving and understanding to anybody in life, and most especially those who are close to you. And your parents are going to be close to you if you have that self-respect. But if you don't have it, Forget it. All the outward demands and obligations and so forth are going to lead to nothing but frustrations and irritations. So again, it comes back to the one. The one presence and the one power. And there's the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Uh, this has been a very complicated one because uh, I've read some things, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, some things in some of the old Jewish traditions where... Uh, not only in Judaism either, in some of the early Christian theological discussions, trying to decide, after all, it would be said or inferred, nobody would a crank would take literally the idea that you shouldn't ever kill, because there are certain times that you have to kill. So then, arguing and debating for days on end, when are the times in life when it's right and logical and righteous and good to kill? self-defense and war and etc etc or if somebody has committed a crime you take his life an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth all of these things an awful lot of sincere serious-minded religious discussions have gone on about this and there are those today who will say well that's ridiculous the, the commandment doesn't really mean that at all because if you really take it literally thou shalt not kill then right away it means don't kill ants don't kill mice don't go out and kill super rats you know don't kill animals at all. You've got to be a vegetarian. And then maybe you don't kill the plants either because they live. And, uh, you know, no policeman should kill. Soldiers shouldn't kill. You shouldn't kill. Well, anybody said, well, again, the person would say, well, any, nobody but a crank would take it literally. But what does it mean then? And the only way you can really get to the heart of the thing is to deal with it as Jesus did. He broadened the base of the thing. Because if you talk about killing, then many could feel very righteous. I don't kill anybody, so I'm all right. Jesus said, Ye have heard it said of old, Thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, Everyone who is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. Anytime you get upset about anybody or anything, you're involved in the killing consciousness. 
So then he says, resist not, turn the other cheek, love your enemy, get yourself into the flow and stay in the flow. Now this is what is involved, you see. In other words, we're not dealing with the act, we're dealing with the state of consciousness that leads to the act. Obviously, there's a moral and ethical question about taking a life at any time, and we have many, many uh, moralistic and social attitudes relative to, to the right and wrong of killing, of capital punishment, and all of these things. But the important thing is the state of consciousness. How many times have you ever said or heard or been around when someone has said, I could just kill him for that? You say, well, I really wasn't serious. But the point is, it came out of a killing state of consciousness. Obviously, there are many folks who couldn't kill a fly and yet are in a killing state of consciousness much of the time in their lives. They're angry, disturbed. I just don't like what he does. This is the killing state of consciousness. The point is then, it is this consciousness, this underlying something that the commandment is dealing with because when you get into that consciousness, you're out of the flow of the divine process and you're out of the first commandment. You cannot really have the consciousness that you, the Lord God is one and you are one in the one and you're a whole creature in this divine process and at the same time, be angry about anybody. So when you're angry and upset and irritated, you're out of the flow. That's what this commandment is all about. So you have to commit yourself to getting out of the killing consciousness. And it's very basic. It goes to the basis of our emotional reactions to so many things in life. And that's a big area. So these several commandments deal with somewhat the same idea that I shall not commit adultery. And of course, this gets into an area of, of uh, morality and sex and so forth, which through long years people didn't want to talk about. And uh, then when they did, then they begin to, to equivocate as to what adultery is and what's right and what's wrong. The word adultery comes from the root words add and alter, which means to add other or to dilute by adding something to. Jesus says, uh, puts it in a broader base uh, ideal when he says you have heard it said of old thou shalt not commit adultery but I say unto you he that looketh on a woman with lust in his heart hath already committed adultery so that leaves nobody out not only in the sense that everybody <laughs> not only that everybody has an occasional wandering eye or an occasional thought of this kind but much deeper you see what he's really saying is that it is not the sin but it's the attitude that leads to the sin that we're involved in. It's the state of consciousness. A person can say, I don't sin. Well, many people have read the Ten Commandments. I don't break any of those commandments. I don't commit adultery. I don't kill. I don't steal. You know, I go to church on Sunday, so it lets me out. But none of these leave you out. Every single one of the commandments are very difficult and very relevant if we're willing to deal with them in the broadest possible sense. So we're dealing with attitudes. Any kind of attitude that adulterates the dynamic idea of the oneness and the wholeness of God is committing adultery. Judas was an adulterer because he could not see the spiritual depth of Jesus. Whenever we see less than the Christ, less than the divine, less than the innate perfection of any person or of ourselves, we commit adultery. Now who can say that doesn't apply to me? We're all involved in it. Every one of these commandments deal with, with the states of consciousness that we live within and are seeking to overcome all day long. You adulterate yourself when you sell yourself short through inferiority. When you feel inadequate, you commit adultery. Or when you put somebody else down, you commit adultery. So the point is that you're in the flow. Don't dilute it. Don't weaken it determine that you will not get involved in this adulteration, polluting process of human consciousness, but you'll keep getting back to the one, the realization of allness. Thou shalt not steal. The cosmic law is that whenever you steal, you steal from yourself. A few weeks ago I called that the great self-rip-off. Anytime you try to take something, you know, so many people today have this idea, well, I've got to get back at society, that's the rip-off. But any attempt to get back at anybody is stealing from yourself because there's a divine process involved. Not many people understand this. In other words, it's not that the commandment says you must not steal or else, but what it is saying is you can't steal. There's no way. You're kidding yourself. You're deluding yourself if you try to get something for nothing. 
So the person who really understands this and understands his oneness with the law and understands the idea, that, as Jesus put it to the elder brother, uh, all that is the Father is his mine. It's already mine. Not in the sense I can go out and take it, but in the sense of I have my own inner contact with it. But ultimately, it only has meaning and relevance in my life when I unfold it or demonstrate it out of my own consciousness. Anything else is short-circuiting the process. Even in, in a uh, mammon-worshipping way, to seek to get something out here that I don't have is to get out of the flow. Or to say, well, after all, um, nobody will know, so I'll take it. That's to get out of the flow. It's to break the first commandment. You're out of the consciousness of the allness of God. You can't get something for nothing. Emerson suggests this when he says, um, everyone is concerned that his neighbor should not cheat him, but a day comes when he will be concerned that he should not cheat his neighbor. In other words, he comes to understand the cosmic law. Therefore, he knows that he should never allow himself to be in a situation where he's going to have to pay what I call a hidden luxury tax for something that he thinks he's getting that nobody knows. I mean, such a simple thing as, as, as in, a, in a restaurant, somebody gives you uh, $10 change for a $5 bill. And even, even giving it back might cause the person to be angry because it makes them look, look kind of nutty. They'd much rather almost let you have it than to come back and, and give it back to them. But you wouldn't anymore think of accepting that kind of largesse, as it were, as, oh, well, after all, they've been taking me for a long time. I might as well get a little back. Because you are trying to get something for nothing and you must pay the hidden tax in terms of the divine law for it. And you don't know what that tax is going to be. So you open yourself wide open to accept the kind of the barbs and slings of what the poet calls outrageous fortune, of the tremendous comeback of the negative process, and you can't allow that if you're seeking a harmonious life. So it means that, that when you understand this cosmic law, you will meticulously make sure that you never, never accept or take or demand anything that is not yours or that you haven't earned. That's not to limit yourself. But that's to get yourself right with the law, and then you can expand your consciousness within the law, and then you can have anything that you can be conscious of, that you can develop the inner awareness of, you see. But you don't try to take shortcuts. That's what the commandment's all about. And from then the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It deals with a lot of levels. Don't tell lies about people. Don't criticize but actually, what, when we understand the underlying root of this, we see that what this says is that you can't really bear false witness about anybody. Because when you bear witness to error, you reveal the error of your own consciousness. So it's not a false witness, really. You may tell a lie about somebody or bear some kind of a critical, malicious tale about someone, but you're actually projecting into the ethers as well as into all who will listen the sordid state of your consciousness. This, this deals also with the basic idea of criticism, and it's very important. Criticism comes from the, from the word that was coined by Aristotle, and it originally meant, and its root today still means, looking for the good. And obviously, in certain situations in our life, we have to criticize. It's important as a teacher, as a parent, as a, an employer, you're not really responsible if you don't criticize. But the point is, your criticism must be based on the motivation of building someone up rather than tearing them down. If you're building them up, then you're in the flow of a divine process. You're acting responsibly. If you seek to tear them down, however subtly, then you're bearing false witness. And you're out of the flow of the divine process yourself. And you can't afford it, you see. So we have to reevaluate the whole process of criticism. We say, well, you know, shouldn't I tell somebody that they're, they're doing something wrong? The first thing is ask yourself, do you really want to help him or do you want to make yourself look good by making him look bad? If it's the first, then you should do it. If it's the second, then you're going to break a law and you will be in trouble. Bearing false witness to the truth is what life is all about. Jesus said, I come that I bear witness to the truth. And bearing false witness to the truth is any time that we 
say something positively about ourselves or about someone else that is not fundamental truth. It may be facts, it may be everybody knows it, but it's not fundamental truth. And if I do this without any sincere attempt to try to help or to build up a person or a situation, then I'm breaking this commandment and I'm breaking myself right out of the flow of the divine process of wholeness or oneness. Walt Whitman says, the good or bad I say of another person, I say of myself. What you say about another person will ultimately happen to you by divine law because by saying it, you indicate that it has already happened in you. It's a very important thing to realize, isn't it? What you say about another, good, bad, or limited, or what? What you say about another will ultimately happen to you because by saying it, you indicate that it's already happened in you and you're bearing witness to a level of your own consciousness. Finally, the Tenth Commandment, Thou shalt not covet. I mentioned last week, this is the one we dealt with last week, and the, the idea of covetousness normally has been thought of, uh, of being inordinate desire or greed and so forth, but actually the word covet comes from the word love, the word passion. And there's nothing wrong to love, nothing wrong with loving or with wanting passionately. The important thing is, what do we love and what do we want passionately? And if we have gotten out of the consciousness of the allness in which we live, where we have our own unique individualization of the divine flow, of divine mind, divine substance, then we may passionately want this or that, a person, a relationship, money, things, power. Out here, I'm out of the flow, and therefore I'm involved in covetousness. And actually, by wanting this out here as that which is going to give me power or prestige or fulfillment or whatever, I am cutting myself off from the source of fulfillment and security within myself. And that person who was involved in covetousness is always miserably unhappy and terribly discontent. Even if he is able, in one way or another, to acquire the things that he covets, he never has security or happiness because his mind is always out here. He thinks that the world is where it's at, you see. It's not wrong to want passionately if we're established in this fundamental realization of the Lord God is one and I'm one in the one. Because then the most important thing we want is the free flow of the divine process within us. Jesus says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then he adds for they shall be filled. Now this is covetousness, but in its proper perspective. It's coveting the divine process, loving it, wanting passionately to have that divine flow. And when we have that direction of our covetousness toward the within, then it's, as Jesus said in another context, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added. If there's something out here you want, then the important thing is, why do you want it? Do you really appreciate it? Do you want it or do you just want to have it? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? Do you want it or do you want to have it? In many cases, we simply want to own it. We want to possess it. We feel insecure and we feel that possessing that thing is going to give me security. But do you really want it? If you want it, then... You can actually experience it, enjoy it, and be a part of it without ever having it. And if you get in the consciousness of appreciating and enjoying something without having it, then ultimately you may well have it too, but it will, it will come naturally in an easy, orderly way out of the flow. But if we're involved in the covetousness of always wanting to have, I want that for my own, I want this, I want to possess that, I want to have that, then we're out of the consciousness of our own flow and we have a tremendous inner lack and void, spiritual poverty, which is probably one of the most frequent symptoms of humankind everywhere. Thou shalt not covet, you see. Life is lived from inside out. And you are one with the one. And all that the Father has is yours. You live in the consciousness of it. So first of all, you see the thing out here and you love it, you appreciate it. Before you would let that human covetous desire say to you, I must have that. I gotta have that. Appreciate it. Love it. Give thanks for it. 
See it in its present setting. Bless it. And if somebody else has it, rather than letting your mind run in jealousy, be grateful that he has it. Praise him for having it because it's come out of the flow of his consciousness. And let that be an indication that if it comes out of the flow of his consciousness, it comes out of the flow of God. I have my own unique relationship with God. Good can come out of the flow of me too. Not by trying to get his, because that makes me say, I want to be like he is, and I can't be like he is, I can only be like myself. Covetousness is a very important area of this process, and it's probably true that most of the world's problems, international bad relationships and wars and conflicts come out of covetousness, subtly, and the conflicts of people everywhere. But it all boils down, you see, and it all builds upon this fundamental commandment, the Lord God is one. Really work with this commandment and all the others become commentary and they simply become little guidelines. Check yourself up. It's like looking in the mirror here and looking in the mirror there and looking in the mirror there. You're seeing yourself from different sides. But basically what you're really trying to do is to establish your own uniqueness, your own wholeness. And you only do that when you get the realization of the Lord God is one and I am one in the one. And I am the activity of the one expressing as me. Time is up. Sorry. Thank you.